All right, Jeff. Jeff, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? I was born um, outside of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, I moved to Clearwater, Florida when I was young, like three years old. But I uh, grew up all around Pinellas County, uh, Clearwater, St. Pete, Tampa, Palm Harbor, mm -hmm. that whole area. What was your family like? Um, it was a pretty normal family, I'd say, really. Um, you know, my parents are still together. Um, you know, brother successful. My sister's pretty successful. Um, you know, they all went on to live normal, good lives, pretty much. Um, you know, and, you know, I played baseball. It was kind of a typical childhood, I guess, um, for the most part. Um, Things went sideways for you at some point, though? Yeah, I'd say the start of high school. Um, like, uh, my brother is five years older than me, so when he, I feel like when he went away to college, um, and I, I started high school, you know, he was a good influence on me. He left. I feel like I kind of started smoking weed and just hanging with the wrong crowd kind of thing, uh, at that point. How far did you in school? I went to college. Um, I never finished though. Um, I, you know, graduated high school, went to St. Petersburg college for like a, a year or two and then ended up dropping out. What kind of work have you done? Um, you know, your standard, standard little jobs up until I was in my early 20s. Um, and then uh, I got into the sign business. So, like, all aspects of the sign business, really. Like, uh, vinyl shops, print shops, sign installation, service, um, stuff like that. That kind of got me into graphic design. Um running printers and stuff like that. And you eventually turned that into another hustle. You could say that. <laughs> um, yeah, basically, you know, I dropped out of uh, college, um, started kind of partying too much, um, you know, developed a, a drug addiction, basically. Um, you know, selling weed and pills and stuff. When I was uh, in college was when opiates really hit Florida. Um, so that was a big, big part of that. Um, you know, um, so I just developed a, a drug habit um, and kind of, you know, eventually met a girl. We got married, um, had some kids, still functioning as this drug addict. Um, but uh, I kind of I moved out of Florida um, to kind of get away from the drug scene, and uh, my wife and kids and I moved to Knoxville. Uh, I got a job in a sign business, um, you know, learned a little more graphic design stuff like that. Um, and by moving to Knoxville, I didn't really know a lot of the same people, so like I couldn't really sell drugs like I used to. Um, so. Basically, like, I, I found myself in a, a desperate financial situation. Um, you know, like, uh, the lease was up in my house in a month or two. Um, I wrecked a bucket truck at the sign company, so I got fired. Um, then, you know, I was ha had like a hundred dollar a day heroin habit with, you know, kids and a wife and all this. So, like, my first instinct was to go back to selling drugs, but I didn't really... I know as many people as I knew in Florida, so basically I started counterfeiting to uh, to kind of, well, my, my plan was to just get out of the desperate situation I was in, but it kind of spiraled out of control a little bit, I would say. Um, and you're counter counterfeiting what exactly? Uh, $100 bills, Federal Reserve notes. Hmm. And this was the, the newer ones with the blue band, or? Uh, both. So like, well, I, I started, uh, with twenties. Um, and I just, I, I, there was one drug dealer I knew who worked at the sign company with me, who was a pretty high level drug dealer. Um, so I, I kind of told him like, I'm thinking about, cause I, I dabbled in counterfeiting when I was younger. Um, so I brought it up to him like, Hey, I think I'm going to start printing money again. Um, maybe you could use some to re up or whatever. Um, and he was all for it, so I, I printed some 20s, like I think 5000 and $20 bills. Um, 
and gave them to him and he went to Atlanta, re-upped and, you know, everything went fine with it. So I started kind of selling him 20s and started working on these hundreds. Um, but I, I was, the whole time I was doing this, I was working towards making like the blue notes perfect. Um, but the the older 96 series hundreds were just so easy for me to make um, that it was it was just more profitable, basically. Like, I could make a blue note, but it would take me about an hour um, to, like, handcraft this bill um, for a hundred bucks. And to sit there for an hour, you know, really wasn't worth it as much. Um, but it was a lot easier to mass produce the 96 series. Um, so I, I mainly focused on on the 96 series hundred dollar bills. Which are, which are still being used today. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. They're, they're a little more rare than they were. Um, cause when I was doing this, it was like three or four years ago. So now, I mean, if you go went to the bank and pulled out a thousand dollars, there's a good chance you'd have one. Um, you know, they might give you one. Um, so they're still in circulation. But, but if you, if you went to, went to use, let's say a dozen of the old hundred dollar bills, that would be a red flag. Uh, yeah, a dozen, no. I'd say. Um, I, I always tried to keep it, uh, like, so my whole thing was selling them um, to different people I knew um, who had their own dealings in the street and stuff, and when I broke them myself, I'd usually keep it at, like, one or two bills at a time, um, and I'd normally, like, I'd change the serial numbers on each bill, uh, so... You know, I'd have like a little bank envelope and just walk into a store and all the serial numbers would be sequential. So, you know, if they said, if the cashier were to say anything about me using three old $100 bills, the serial numbers would all be different. And, you know, I'd just explain I went to the bank or whatever. But no one really questioned me ever. Um, I, I kind of start, first started just breaking them, like buying something for $10, getting $90 change or whatever. Um, but then I found that uh, buying like prepaid Visa cards, you could buy a hundred dollar prepaid Visa card, and um, you know there's like a four dollar fee attached to it. So if you gave them two hundred dollar bills, you could get a hundred dollar prepaid Visa card and ninety five dollars change. So I'd go into like you know these big uh, stores, um, you know, and go to like the electronics center register and a couple registers up front and a garden center and hit up like four or five registers buying these prepaid visa cards um and could leave you know a store with like a thousand dollars what thoughts or emotions went through your head when you realized you're printing money and it's working um well yeah at first it was definitely uh, nervous. I, I I didn't want to spend any really like I had this plan to to sell them to a buddy of mine um, and that was it. I was going to sell enough to where I could, you know, get a new house and get on my feet and stuff. Um, but then uh, he got arrested on his own drug charges. Um, so basically that I didn't have anyone else to sell these bills to. So I was I found myself in this hotel room with my wife and kids um, and nobody to sell the bills to. So I started just you know, out of desperation, spending on myself. Um, and, you know, at first it was super nerve wracking, um, you know, because I look at the finest little details, like everyone I showed them to said they looked amazing, um, you know, but I, I just see the, the slightest little flaws and everything. So um, it was definitely nerve wracking. But after, you know, I went to probably five, 10 places and they all, every, every cashier would just mark it with a pen or hold it up and look for the strip of the watermark or, um, so, you know, after breaking about 10 of them without any issue, it's that then it became, you know, it's free money basically. <laughs> How complicated is it to, to print a convincing fake hundred dollar bill? Um, I mean, do you, do you treat the, the paper differently or do anything like that? Well, I, I kind of found, a like a specific recipe, if you will. Um, so like, I, I knew I needed to sandwich two sheets together um, to embed a strip and a watermark. Um, like a lot of people will bleach $5 bills and, but then it, the watermarks are different. And um, 
all that is just so the pen, the counterfeit detection pens mark properly. Um, but I found that if you spray the paper with a lacquer, a matte lacquer spray, it coats the paper so the counterfeit detection pens can't react with the paper because you're coating it. So basically, uh, any paper, like bleaching a five is pointless basically because I could coat any paper with a, a matte lacquer spray. So I needed thin enough paper to sandwich two sheets together. Um, but it needed to be opaque enough to where you couldn't see the strip and watermark through the face of the bill. Um, and I found that Bible paper worked significantly well because um, it was really thin and actually certain types of Bible paper um, are are made out of a cotton linen rag, just like currency. So basically, you know, I would go to, uh, you know, bookstores and find these certain types of Bibles. And normally there's like anywhere from five to 20, some, some Bibles have like 40 blank pages um, in the front and back. So I just kind of rip out the blank pages. Um, and at the time I was living at a hotel, so there's always a Bible in the, the nightstand. I'd go to thrift stores, just acquire these Bibles, get all the blank pages, um, and uh, basically print the front and the back, and then on the back of the back, I'd print a strip and a watermark. Um, and, uh, you know, basically, I had a light board to where I could uh, mist on a little bit of Gorilla Glue spray and uh, line everything up, and the light would shine through the glass so I could line everything up and squeegee them together. And then... Uh, you know, spray on this matte lacquer spray can uh, to to prevent the counterfeit detection pens from reacting. Um, and then I uh, replicated the color shifting ink by, I found this uh, Revlon eyeshadow. It's a holographic green. It's really like, it's really a color shifting pigment. It's, it's green to, metallic green to invisible. It like disappears as you shift it. So I'd print the little 100 in the corner black um, through like my graphic design work. I'd go in and uh, adjust the um, the contrast and, and everything to make the 100 just solid black. And then I'd go over it with this iridescent green eyeshadow to give it a color shifting effect. Um, so, and, and I bought, uh, I found online these invisible ink UV pens, which are kind of like marketed towards kids diaries like a girl can write in her diary and it's invisible unless you shine a black light on it to like keep her diary private or whatever and uh you can buy specifically uh red ink uh invisible ink uv pens so i'd draw a line over where the strip was so i'd put a ruler over the strip and draw a line with this invisible ink uv pen so if they put it in a black light the strip would appear to glow red and everything so i, I basically had this recipe of like pretty much all the security features beat um, to where at least any cashier at any store couldn't tell that they were fake. Did you ever get caught or ever get, I mean, not caught by the feds, but I mean, just any store ever saying this is fake? Uh, a couple times there was, there was issues, but it was only after I'd been to a store, I'd go to the same store too many times. Mm -hmm. um, so like I'd travel around a lot, um, you know, going to different cities, you know, busting bills. But Knoxville was kind of like, is where I live. So I, I hit a lot of the, the same stores in Knoxville, which uh, probably wasn't the best decision. But how, how much money do you think you've printed? Um, it's hard to say, really. Um, I'd say anywhere from 800000 to a little over a million over the course of like a year and a half. You think some of those bills are still in in circulation now? Possibly, possibly. I mean, that I, I was selling to a lot of drug dealers who were moving money. Um, actually, in my discovery, there was a packet of where all these bills uh, that they could link to me, where they found them, and they were throughout the country. So it's, it's interesting to see where drug money travels off to. Some in Texas, I've never even, you know, spent a bill in Texas, but a bunch popped up in Texas and Florida. Uh, you know, New York, California, all over the place. Did your wife know you were doing this? Yeah, she was, uh, you know, we were living out of a hotel room together, so it was kind of hard to hide it. But mm -hmm. no, she, I mean, I, I don't think she, uh, 
knew the the extent of what it was going to be it, it kind of i think i probably convinced her like oh this you know this was just going to be a temporary thing to get on her feet um and then of course you know it came to where i could print as much money as we wanted so you know obviously temptation got the best of both of us i think um it was your original intention just to do this as a short-term thing just to get out of the jam yeah um i, I mean i knew that uh if i continued it i would eventually get caught um but you know looking looking hard, back hard on stop, it, right? yeah i mean i was on drugs um and it, it was an unlimited amount of, of money <laughs> so it was you know and i was i, I was would like to say I was pretty wise about how I went about things. I mean, they never caught me until I was set up by an informant, um, a drug dealer I was selling bills to. So, like, I don't think they ever really could have caught me um, if I didn't sell sell bills in bulk. I mean, just going into stores, like, I'd go to, say, Atlanta for a week and go shopping in Atlanta and then leave. And I mean, by the time, if you break a bill at a store, um, as long as it gets by that cashier, you know what I mean? At, at the time you spend it, then it's, it's in the register. Then there's a whole process of, you know, it's sitting in the safe and then an armored car picks it up, takes it to the bank. The bank will find out it's fake. But at that point, it's a week later and I'm already in another city. Is, so. it, is it stressful traveling around spending counterfeit money? Um... I mean, yeah, I would say it, it was stressful, but also like fun on, on the same, you know, it's definitely, I'd, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't, uh, you know, thrilling on some level, um, you know, just having as much money as you wanted every day, traveling around, uh, you know, living at a hotels. It was kind of our job to wake up in the hotel, print you know wake up at eight in the morning we'd print till about noon or one in the afternoon um and then go shopping till 10 11 at night and then you know just do it that, that was all day every day for years i um, imagine it's got to be terribly difficult to quit and yeah just, and go back to getting a job and making yeah <laughs> what you were making before yeah for sure to go back uh yeah, I think of that like that. I mean, I've got a good job now. I, I'm a production manager at a print shop. Um, but yeah, to think like what I make in two weeks is was something I could do in a couple hours uh, is definitely. They say the recidivism rate of uh, a counterfeiter is, is higher than a, a heroin addict, yeah. actually. That's, that's the stat I've heard. But hmm. And I'm both, so. <laughs> <laughs> Have you... Um... So you did get caught. Yeah. Tell me about that. Um, so, you know, being on heroin, uh, naturally, I would also buy buy drugs from people. Um, Knoxville is a city where a lot of people from out of town come and sell drugs in Knoxville. Because, um, you know, say in like Detroit and Chicago, uh, you know, heroin especially is really cheap and, and high quality up there. Um, so a lot of dealers will will get a brick of heroin and come down to these mid-level cities to sell it. Because, um, you know, you can get a, a kilo for $20,000 in Detroit, which, you know, equates to $20 a gram. Um, and a gram in Knoxville sells for $100, you know, and, and, and the qualities to where you can take that kilo and make two kilos. So you're really getting it for ten dollars a gram, and you can sell it for a hundred. You know what I mean? So it's a huge markup. But nonetheless, lots of drug dealers come from different cities to Knoxville, um, and uh, so there's a lot of people basically just going up to strangers, trying to meet people to sell drugs. You know. Um, so in my case, I met a lot of people. You know, they offer to sell heroin or whatever, and I'd use counterfeit money. Um, and, uh, you know, some people would find out that the bills were fake and they'd be pissed off, whatever. I wouldn't answer the phone kind of thing, just duck people. Um, but other people, um, you know, the bills looked so good and I'd, I'd continuously get them for like a month with these fake bills. Um, and when they finally found out that they were fake, 
they weren't necessarily mad because they were able to spend the bills themselves. They were able to re-up or whatever. So, um, you know, when they did find out, they just wanted more. They just, you know, um, wanted to start buying them from me. Or a lot of people would continuously sell me heroin for the fake money, knowing it was fake. They'd just say, you know, instead of giving me $100 for a gram, give me four fake $100 bills for a gram kind of thing. So I basically, I built these relationships with these dealers um, who knew what I was doing. They were buying bills from me. Um, like every time they'd go to Detroit or, or Cleveland or Atlanta to re-up, they'd, they'd want five or 10 grand of my bills to, to mix in with their real money. So um, I ended up meeting, you know, over the course of a couple of years, about 10, 10 people or so that was doing this. Um, and one of them was from Cleveland. So we'd uh, go up to Cleveland together. He'd, he'd re-up, buy like a brick of heroin or whatever. I'd go bus bills throughout the city. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd sell him bills. I'd get dope from him, whatever. We had this little system going. Um, and uh, one time we were supposed to go to Cleveland together, but I had a little warrant uh, for a, like a failure to appear. It was just like a little petty charge. I went to jail, bonded out, um, but he had to go re-up, so he went to Cleveland without me. Basically, uh, while he was up in Cleveland, he got pulled over, and they found, I think it was like 20000 in real cash and 5000 in fake bills. Um, and, yeah, basically, it didn't take him long to try to set me up <laughs> basically the secret service got involved i've got the uh like the interrogation tapes in my discovery of um you know them interrogating him um you know the secret service came in asked him about the bills he told him that it was from his source in knoxville which was me um so basically he brought the so the cleveland secret service um basically promised that they wouldn't charge him with the bills if they if he set me up um but by doing so they brought him down to knoxville um but there was already an ongoing case in knoxville trying to find who i was i guess so um basically he set me up and and uh you know then the the knoxville branch of the secret service ended up indicting him as a co-conspirator on my case even though he's the one that you know set me up but um, so yeah, basically he called me, uh, and he was trying to set me up for things that I don't even do. Like he was asking me to get him 700 grams of heroin, uh, over the phone, which, you know, I don't never sold that much drugs like that. You know what I mean? So as soon as he asked me that over the phone, I already knew that, uh, you know, he was cooperating or something wasn't right. Um, cause we never talked over the phone you know, about anything, let alone 700 grams of heroin. So, um, you know, he asked me about that. I just ended the conversation, but, uh, I guess through that conversation, they GPS pinged my phone to which hotel I was staying at. And, uh, eventually, yeah, just kicked in the door and found me. I was in there printing at, at the time that they, they raided the room. So mm, how much time did you do? Uh, I, well, I only un ended up getting 10 months. Um, originally, the sentencing guidelines was for about 24 months because um, I didn't have much of a criminal history. Um, but the Secret Service basically said that the, the bills I was making were the highest quality they've seen in 25 years. Um, and the, the techniques I used were unique, I guess. Um, so they basically offered me a deal um, that if I made a training video for future Secret Service agents, um, kind of explaining my process, um, obviously, you know, admitting guilt and everything, um, and yeah, making this like training video, uh, they'd reduce my sentence. So um, I basically like walked into the Secret Service headquarters and they had all, all the evidence from my hotel room because I was in the process of making bills when they raided my room. So. They had, you know, everything I needed to make bills. Um, and, yeah, they just asked me questions about how I, how I learned how to do all this. Um, 
you know, and had me make a couple bills on, on camera. They flew a film crew down from DC to Knoxville, um, and filmed the, the whole process. Um, and, uh, when they raided my room, they, they found a couple of the new blue notes with the, uh, the motion strip, um, 3d security ribbon. Um, so they wanted to know how I was able to counterfeit that. Um, and yeah, basically I just explained the whole process. I actually found out how to counterfeit the 3d security ribbon through Google patents. Um, so the company that, uh, that makes the 3D security ribbon for the Bureau of Engraving and Printing is, uh, it's a private company, it's called Crane Currency. So they actually patented the technology that, that is the 3D security ribbon, it's patented under motion. So I was able to go on Google Patents and find this patent and kind of figure out how, how they manufacture the strips themselves. And uh, I could find vendors, Chinese vendors online that sell the same fly eye lenticular men's array film um, and yeah, basically just through a little process, laying this film over a certain type of print, and, you know, you can replicate that. But like I said, the counterfeiting the blue notes just took so long that it really wasn't worth the time, I would say. With, with the 96 series still being accepted, it was, that was mainly what I, what I did, but, um... When they raided the hotel room, they found my laptops with all my serial numbers, though, because I changed every serial number. So through that, they could link me to, like, hundreds of thousands of dollars they found throughout the East Coast. What's your biggest regret in all of this? Uh, you know, it's hard to say, really. Cause you, didn't, you didn't do a tremendous amount of time. Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, everything did kind of work out for the best. Um you know, obviously it, uh, you know, all this whole situation ruined my marriage. Uh, you know, I feel bad for my kids having them be involved in everything. Um, but really, it, you know, I didn't do a lot of time. It got me sober. You know, it's opened up. This whole story has opened up a lot of opportunities for me. I'm writing a book right now. Um, it got you sober. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, and that and that's something I've been, you know, try. I've been trying to get sober for years and years, really. Um, is it just being being put away without a any yeah cho chance of doing it. Yeah, really. Um, you know, w when you have kids and stuff, it's hard to just be dope sick for a month, and you know, just the whole the whole trap that is drug addiction. You know, what I mean, it's hard to get out of. Even even if you really want it, it's you know, when you have obligations and stuff, it's hard to to quit really um so like really the the year i did in prison you know was good for me i think in a sense do you have any temptations to start printing again um i mean not in reality i i mean i i think they, they would they would look to you first right? oh yeah see I, i'm in the situation to where like the the techniques i used were so like unique to me that, yeah, I mean, if I were to do it again, they'd instantly come knocking on my door. So, I mean, like, of course, the, there's the the fantasy is still back there. You know what I mean? Like, it was fun. Obviously, having a tap of unlimited money is is always tempting. But, yeah, in reality, I mean, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't wouldn't print again. And Jeff, what would you say is the most important lesson you learned in all of this? Man, it's hard. It's hard to say, really. Um, really, just you know, I feel like I wouldn't have if I didn't make bad decisions. I wouldn't have been in the desperate situation I was to begin with. Um, so, you know, really, I'm I'm trying to like as of right now, I'm starting my life over from scratch. You know, even though I only did like a year in prison. Um, you know how's your family take it uh i mean they're supportive now you know i think my parents kind of wrote me off a long time ago you know it's like you know being a criminal drug addict whatever um so i mean really i, I think my parents think that all this was a blessing in a way um 
you know, because I've been I've been trying to get clean for years. I tried the Suboxone. I tried all this, you know, all, all these different things. I was on pills, prescribed. I went to Suboxone. I did the street heroin. Like I tried all these different things, and nothing was really working as as far as truly functioning. Um, so, you know. Really, I, everything worked out for the best. Um, you know, I mean, of course, there's there's regrets, but uh, it's hard to say what I've really learned from all this. Besides, uh, don't do drugs, and uh, you know, uh, don't print money. Don't print money. I mean, I guess, yeah. All right, Jeff. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks. Super interesting. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.